Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this important and timely panel. I'm James Cox. I'm the executive director of Pacifica and one of the organizers of the Raising Peace Festival. I hope that you've been making the most of this wide ranging program. Um, we've been delighted to have nearly a thousand people sign up for events across the course of the week. I begin today by acknowledging that those of us here in Australia live on stolen lands that were never ceded. I honour Australia's First Nations elders and all of those who struggle to resolve our violent past in pursuit of a peaceful future. Struggle against outside forces with the desire to live in peace on one's homeland is a thread that connects First Nations people in Australia with the diverse cultures of Afghanistan and indeed many other parts of the world. In acknowledging their struggles here, we extend that recognition to all peoples of the world who struggle against violent occupation and who strive for peace. So first up, I would like to introduce Diane Tippett and uh, she's going to introduce our session and moderator in more detail. Um, Diane is completing her PhD at the Department of Peace and Conflict Studies at the University of Sydney, which is one of the co-sponsors of today's panel. Diane's PhD thesis will grapple with the mechanisms of political polarization in Soviet and American occupied Afghanistan, building on her previous research on extremist political actors in the protracted conflict in the Russian North Caucasus. So Diane, I shall pass to you. Thank you, James. And um, thank you, James, also for being uh, the proposer and main driver of this event. Uh, the future for peace in Afghanistan is reflected in the experiences, work and network of our holy Afghan panel today. The panel is deliberately and explicitly focused on bringing together Afghans from diverse backgrounds to discuss their various perspectives on and experiences of Afghanistan and to radically speculate on the future of the country, including a discussion of not just the challenges that lay ahead, but also about the prospects for peace. During one of the early planning meetings for this panel, it was noted that often Afghan people are expected to provide testimonials for the theorizing of Western scholars. We want to eclipse that trend and instead amplify Afghan voices on Afghanistan, particularly the voices of women who have such a unique agency and capacity to resist. Without further ado then, I would like to introduce our moderator today, Senator Faruqi, who will then introduce our panelists. Dr. Faruqi is the Green Senator for New South Wales and spokesperson for anti-racism, education, housing, industry, and international aid. She is a civil and environmental engineer and a lifelong activist for social and environmental justice. She became the first Muslim woman to sit in any Australian parliament when she joined the New South Wales Parliament in 2013. In 2018, she took her proudly feminist and anti-racist approach to federal parliament when she joined the Senate. She's an activist for anti-colonial international aid, climate justice and reparations for the global South. I'd now like to pass on to Dr. Faruqi herself to introduce our panelists and begin the panel discussion. Thanks so much, Diane and James as well. I'd also like to start by acknowledging that I am on Gadigal land and pay my respects to elders past and present. Wherever we are in this country, we are on stolen land. Sovereignty was never ceded. This is, always was, and always will be Aboriginal land. And I am really honored to be moderating this event today um, as we are not just centering Afghan voices here, but also really deeply listening to their expertise on the various aspects of the current situation in Afghanistan. Um, and as um, you said, Diane, unfortunately, many times people from minorities are invited to events as token voices to share their testimonials and their stories. But the critical discussions that should inform decision making and policy are often left to others. For decades now, the people of Afghanistan have been caught between the misogynistic and extremely violent Taliban on the one hand and the deadly foreign military occupation on the other of which Australia was a part. And in all of this, the hollow self-serving concerns about the safety of women were also paraded around to justify the ongoing Western intervention and Australia's involvement in the invasion and occupation of Afghanistan. When we know full well that women, girls and children bear a vastly disproportionate burden of war itself and the havoc that comes after. And people so often love to speak on behalf of those being targeted, persecuted, 
or discriminated against, as if they have no agency or no capacity to resist or fight back, as if they need to be perpetually protected by the white savior industrial complex. So this is a really important time to step back and listen to what Afghan people are saying and what their research and critique reveals about the history, the present and the future. Um, as we mark International Peace Day throughout this week, we are in a moment in time when we really need to take a long and hard look at the fallout from wars and to make a shift towards peaceful futures. And this includes looking at the various fundamentalisms and interventions that have silenced the voices and perspectives of local people and communities. And also take a critical look at the role of foreign aid, the so-called peace efforts brokered by those who have no real stake in the process and how Afghanistan's economy and society have been impacted by decades of war and conflict. So I'm really looking forward to our panel discussion today on all this and much more. And welcome to everyone who's joined us today as well. Uh, and I'll start by introducing our wonderful speakers. Uh, first up, Mujib Abid. Mujib is a PhD candidate at the School of Political Science and International Studies at the University of Queensland. His research focuses on histories of encounters with modernity in Afghanistan, with a particular focus on modernist enactments of power and embodied subaltern experiences, resistance and tradition. And Mujib brings in and also critiques a post-colonial and decolonial sensibility to his work. He currently teaches as a sessional academic at the University of Melbourne. Next, we have Salma Abid. Salma is studying a master's in international relations at Istanbul Kultur University after completing her undergraduate studies in political science in Kabul. She is the founder of Bahar New Spring for the Female Voice, an online platform which publishes Afghan female voices and offers feminist social commentary. She's also a writer and is particularly interested in exploring the intersections between feminism and Islam. Mohib Iqbal. Mohib is an economist on the World Bank programs in Afghanistan. He has previously worked in the Institute of Economics and Peace as research, a senior research fellow. Mohib's research focuses on the economic impacts of war and the dynamics of the war economies, including the role of foreign aid. Mohib holds a master's degree in development economics from the Australian National University. We also have Zarlasht Sarwari joining us. Zarlasht is a PhD candidate and a researcher in the School of Social Sciences at Western Sydney University. Her research examines how long distance nationalism plays out in the Afghan diaspora in Australia, particularly how it impacts on identity, construction and notions of belonging. Zarlasht has a Bachelor of Social Science and a Bachelor of Commerce and an honors degree in political and international relations. She has formerly worked with the Department of Premier and Cabinet in WA and at the University of Western Australia and the University of New South Wales. And Zarlasht currently works in the Challenging Racism Project at the Western Sydney University. Jawed Nader joins us as a Scientia PhD candidate at the University of New South Wales where he researches the impact of social media on societies in conflict. Previously, he worked with the government of Afghanistan and civil society organizations in Afghanistan and the UK. He has served as director of the Afghanistan Land Authority from 2009 to 2011, and the director of the British and Irish agencies Afghanistan Group from 2012 to 2019. And our final panelist whose introduction I will do is Farhunde Akbari. Farhunde is a PhD candidate at the Australian National University. Her research focuses on diplomatic actors and peace settlements with non-state armed actors, looking at the cases of the Taliban in Afghanistan and the Khmer Rouge in Cambodia. She has a bachelor's and master's in international relations from La Trobe and the University of Melbourne and an advanced master's in diplomacy from the Australian National University. Prakhunde has worked in Afghanistan's independent directorate of local governance 
and the United Nations headquarters in Afghanistan Independent Human Rights Commission. So a very warm welcome to you all. And there's absolutely no doubt and such a privilege for all of us to have so much experience and expertise who we'll be listening to and hearing from today. So what I might do is start off with a question which I'd like all of you to respond to. And we might start with Zarlasht. So what I'd like you to do is just tell us a little bit about your relationship to Afghanistan and what has brought you to the research or work that you are doing currently. So Zarlasht, let's start with you. Thank you, Senator Faruqi, and to the organizers of the Raising Peace Festival for inviting me as part of this panel. I'm speaking to you all from Daruk country in Sydney's West. My relationship to Afghanistan has been as a child of the diaspora uh, from a family who were among the first to go into exile following the Soviet coup and invasion uh, in 1979. My husband's family, on the other hand, remained there and during the civil war until their departure in the mid 1990s. And they spent several years as refugees in Pakistan before arriving in Australia. Um, there's, there's been a confluence of factors I experienced over time, which compelled me to pursue the research I'm now doing on constructions of Afghan identity in Australia. One was through my opportunities uh, for travel. Uh, so I, I have been to Afghanistan on two occasions and this enabled me to physically connect with my place of heritage. And I've also traveled to other diasporic sites where Afghan communities reside in Europe and North America. This allowed me to experience the loose networks of transnational communities that connected my family. The second has been my encounter with Afghan asylum seekers who were placed in detention by the Australian government in Perth and Port Hedland. Uh, this was in the early 2000s. Their experience highlighted the impossible choices faced by many who were fleeing Taliban in Afghanistan at that time, only to be, placed, only to be faced with Australia's arbitrary immigration uh, detention policy, which branded them as suspects. So this made me question how much the lives of Afghans have been impacted by the interests of states and non-state actors in the global world order. And finally, it has been through the experience of motherhood and its associated responsibilities for transmission of cultural knowledge, which made me uh, think more about the endurance of Afghan identity, the contested nature of Afghan identity, Absolutely. the diverse trajectories and experience among Afghans and how might future generations negotiate their tenuous connection to a homeland mired by uh, you know, more than four decades of war. Thank you, Zarlash. And if I could go to you, Majib, and ask that same question, like what is um, kind of your relationship to Afghanistan and what, what brings you to the research that you're doing? Thank you, Senator Faruqi, and to everyone who's showing interest uh, in Afghanistan and, and showing up in such impressive numbers here, our audience. Look, I, I, I'm a part of a generation who you know, went to school under the original Taliban regime and then sort of came of age under the American occupation. And as the years wore on, you know, me and families like mine, our worlds kind of began to shrink quite dramatically into sort of uh, the so-called safe spaces uh, of, you know, urban urban settings like Kabul and the places that we were born in, in my case, the a tiny province to the south of Kabul and south that would, you know, more and more be out of reach for us. But then, you know, being in Kabul, of course, you're exposed to a particular sort of, uh, you know, discourse setting power, as well as the material realities of occupation and life under it. And so, you know, I'm, for example, trained at the, you know, aptly named American University of Afghanistan. And as you can imagine, it's uh, liberal undertones, colonialist undertones. Um, it's a you know, very unique approach to uh, curriculum delivery and design and how that was all explicitly designed to produce the so-called next generation of um, or future, gener future leaders of Afghanistan. Um, you know, I'm a product of that. So what sort of brings me to the type of research that um, I do right now 
is sort of these modalities that would be produced as a, as a, as a solution to the Afghan question, time and again, coming from different registers. But uh, because of the latent politics behind it, uh, you know, every single time, I mean, remind you, when you're younger, you come under their influence perhaps more, more easily. The number of times that I cringe when my friends tell me about my youth and my <laughs> politics at the undergrad school, uh, it's not even funny. But sort of coming from that background and then eventually coming to Australia for postgraduate studies and then staying within the Western Academy and its, its sort of various spaces, it's this constant search for a type of critical grammar or critical language that can, at least from where I'm standing, speak to the Afghanistan that I know and how the many different ideological sort of framings in many ways had these glaring blind spots or had these assumptions that um, kind of almost would bind them together, you know, in their attempt to hegemonize or perhaps impose a certain order, even though they would not claim to come from the same sort of uh, locations. And uh, that's why, uh, you know, I can, that's, it's, it's an ongoing uh, search. It's an ongoing um, attempt at uh, seeking this particular language, but uh, I'm sort of very much open to it. And I continue to search and, and, and speak to people and, and, and also introspect. I mean, having grown up in Pakistan, my kind of, um, you know, younger years have also been very entwined in what was happening in Afghanistan. I remember when I was studying engineering at university there, a few of my class fellows actually went off to fight the Russians um, at that time. So, yeah, it, I guess very uh, drastic times and have been going on for such a long time. Uh, so, Farkhande, if I could ask you, you have looked at peace settlements and, you know, at a time when peace has really eluded Afghanistan. Um, tell us a little bit about that. Uh, thank you very much, Senator. It's I also like to thank um, the Raising Peace Festival for the opportunity and the audience um, uh, for their participation and giving uh, their time to listen to us. Um, um, if I make a wish that one day uh, we hope to host um, a, a physical peace festival um, to mark the end of four decades of conflict in Afghanistan, somewhere on the foot of the majestic Hindu Kush mountain and serve you delicious fruits um, of the season. And, 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 and we live with that dream. Um, coming back uh, to your question about uh, my research on peace settlement, I started uh, my, um, my PhD um, uh, uh, journey in 2017, but by that time, the uh, idea of settling the Afghan conflict through a political settlement was, uh, was, was widely discussed. So there was, a, there was a military stalemate on the ground and the and, um, US had already withdrawn majority of its forces in 2014. And, and there was this talks going on uh, directly or indirectly about settling the conflict uh, with the Taliban through negotiation. Uh, my research was, uh, or my question was more about to understand how is uh, um, settlement or peace settlement possible with an extreme actor, a violent insurgency like the Taliban. And to understand that, I picked another case study, which was um, the Khmer Rouge in Cambodia. Um, I was a student of diplomacy at that time. So I wanted to understand and unpack um, the settlement uh, or the idea of the settlement uh, from a diplomatic studies perspective. So I looked at um, actor in diplomacy and what they are required uh, to possess as a characteristics to be able to deliver um, um, a peace um, and, 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 trans and go through a transition from a, an insurgency and an extreme actor um, to a peace settlement. Um, so yeah, and, and as I stepped in for my field work in 2018, October, um, this was also um, coincidentally the first round of the U.S. Taliban um, negotiation started in Doha. I was in Kabul on a taxi going to my one of my interviews and the radio on the taxi was on um, as usual in Kabul and then I heard that Zalmay Khalilzad, the U.S. envoy, has started um, direct negotiation with the Taliban in Doha in absence of the Afghan government. And you can imagine my life 
<laughs> and my research since then, I have been on my toes to try to capture ground realities as things evolve uh, so fastly. And at the same time, I'm about to submit um, uh, my thesis uh, very soon. Congratulations, and we'll come back to details of your research, which it seems fascinating. Uh, but I might go to you, Jawed, and ask you how you came to your research on social media and um, your relationship with Afghanistan. Thank you, uh, Senator Farooqi. Uh, I'd also like to acknowledge uh, the Daruk people uh, from whose land I am calling in from today. And thank you everyone for your interest to be with us in this event today. Um, so I was born in the, uh, in the province of Ghazni in Afghanistan. And like millions of other Afghans, when the, because of the war, uh, my family and I had to go to the neighboring countries. And just as I was uh, graduating high school in 2001, the American forces toppled the then uh, Taliban regime and uh, I returned uh, back to Afghanistan um, to pursue education and work. And I'm very glad to say that um, at the time, my first super work supervisor um, uh, in, in Kabul is still with us. And this event today, she is, uh, she is now my supervisor in the university. So despite all these uh, ruptures, one thing has been continuous and I'm very grateful for that. And uh, Susanna, thank you for being with me all these years. Um, so what happened when I went back to Afghanistan, I worked with national and international NGOs uh, on uh, various issues, including the rights of uh, young people and the rights of um, women and rights of people with disability. And then uh, also moved on to work with the government to modernize its land related uh, services. Um, and then I went to University of Bristol in England to do a master's degree in public policy. And since then, I, uh, after that, I went uh, to work with BOG, British and Irish agencies, Afghanistan group. So Afghanistan has been really the focus of my professional uh, life and now my uh, academic life. And um, it's, a, it's a deep relationship because it's not just a natural one. It's also something that I think about often um, and I have to, I have to think about. So that's, that's how you know, the relationship is. And the social media, um, the, the focus on social media is because in one of my research in BOG, uh, the impact of social media on societal relations in Afghanistan was, was highlighted. Um, and I was a, an avid social media user myself. So I really became keen on the topic and came down to Australia to do a PhD on it. And it's a very fascinating area and I'd love to tell you more about it later. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. And we will def definitely explore that a bit more. Um, so Mahib, you work in an area that I have worked in quite a bit, which is international aid. Um, so tell us a bit about what drove you to, that, to do that research in the context of um, Afghanistan. Thank you, Senator Faroqi, uh, and thank you to the organizers of, uh, of the event. I also speak from the Darug land in the Western Sydney. Um, so, I mean, the start of my career in this area was in a sense intentional, but much accidental, I would say. Um, in 2001, I was in Pakistan studying and 9-11 happens and the October uh, incidents happen and we moved to Afghanistan in 2002. Uh, I finished my studies and uh, started working with USAID. So that's pretty much, uh, I mean, uh, sort of how the events evolved and how Afghanistan changed in major ways. That pretty much sort of drove my life from there to, to, to work in this area. Uh, and then that followed by coming to Australia, finishing my studies here. Uh, I still worked on Afghanistan and South Asia in broader. Uh, so I did a number of very significant studies for Australian government uh, uh, on migration and, and uh, migration intention um, as part of a uh, ANU uh, sort of project with the Department of uh, Immigration and Border Protection. That's what it was called at the time. So we worked across a number of South Asian and Middle Eastern countries. Uh, so that's where I sort of broadened from Afghanistan, but Afghanistan still stayed as a central sort of piece of my research. Um, and then I moved to the Institute for Economics and Peace, and that's where I think I slightly lost sort of that Afghanistan element where I focused on 
uh, global peace uh, in the forming of global peace index, global terrorism index, the global economic impact of violence, uh, which I was leading that that uh, research. I was leading that research team for uh, five and a half years. Um, but that's where I think it got back to me that uh, it was very interesting and fascinating to work across the world in, in very, very sort of interesting work. But I felt a very sort of big vacuum in, in my own personality and in myself that I was not involved in Afghanistan. So I made the decision uh, to go back and work with the World Bank on uh, sort of economic reforms. Um, we were working on local governance. I just got to know that Farhan Dajan had worked there as well. Uh, and I was also working on private sector development and humanitarian aspects of the COVID-19 sort of uh, um, uh, crisis. Uh, I returned to Australia in, in May 2021, right, sort of two months before the crisis sort of uh, evolved again. And, 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 you know, that big sort of uh, transition that has happened, uh, which uh, I mean, the shock of which still exists with myself and, uh, and many, many of, I think, Afghans. Uh, and we are still trying to sort of make sense of it. We are still trying to add interpretation. We are still trying to deal with the new narratives that are emerging across the sort of the board. I mean, how the Western narratives around that are emerging, how our Afghan story is told, what happened. Uh, you know, we are picking our own people to blame and everyone else is picking their own. And that, that story is sort of emerging. Uh, and I'm in that space now uh, where I, I don't know where I'm heading to, but I know that what I have done. Uh, so that's that's sort of my story with Afghanistan. Of course, I'm born there. Um, so, so that's that's pretty much me and Afghanistan uh, over the last 13, 14 years. Um, thanks, Mohib. And now, Salma, how about you and Afghanistan? And of course, your area that you've worked in is something that is very, very close to my heart. And it's frustrating to see how many times the stories of Afghan women have been told, not by Afghan women, but, but by others with a Western lens. Um, so tell us a bit about what brought you to that. Uh, well, thank you, Sartor. Um, I'm happy to be here. Uh, well, uh, regarding how I come to, to see the woman issues, uh, you know, I was born in Afghanistan and I spent my, my childhood, school and undergraduate in Kabul. Uh, so as others, I, I experienced the war years uh, in my all beings. You know, uh, seeing all the social and economic and risks that, uh, risks that mostly comes from the political changes in our country made me to come and see how exactly they, these changes um, have affected women, especially uh, from those who, can, who had occupied our country and, and are climbing as they have uh, come to support women. So uh, first, um, uh, first of all, I, I launched my website where I, I published the stories narratives I, uh, and experiences of Afghan women, their uh, stories and narratives under the past um, 2001 system and today under the domination of Taliban. So, um, and, and also during um, all these, I started my masters in Istanbul, um, Turkey. So um, everything was going um, as usual. I was in Kabul, um, uh, it was my summer vacation, but suddenly the government, which had uh, been moving under the direct support of WIS for 20 years, collapsed and the Taliban once again um, uh, took the control of Afghanistan and and um, obviously this was not a good news for Afghans especially Afghan women um, so just as uh, thousands of other Afghan families I left Afghanistan with my family about um, I guess for uh, more than four weeks ago uh, by military ways. Um, so from here, while I am here, I'm still trying to be connected with women in different parts of Afghanistan to hear and share their accounts of recent changes in their country, as well as to share um, how these changes have affected them. Uh, so I can say I do uh, this. I, I publish the stories of Afghan women to raise their, firstly, to raise their voice and, and, and secondly, uh, for the uh, world to, to understand how, how Afghan women are victims in these political and military games. Um, thanks everyone for sharing um, that connection with Afghanistan. And it is indeed tough time at the moment and have been for a while. I feel that we could talk, talk to each one of you for a whole day, 
and still have plenty more to talk about, um, but, but we'll try and make the best of the time that we have and delve a little bit deeper into each of your areas of research. Um, also, to everyone who's joined us, uh, when questions come to mind, please put them in um, the chat function and we will have time at the end to get to as many of them as we can. So Farkunde, I might start with you and your work on um, the various, I'll call them so-called peace settlements because not many of them have resulted in peace. Um, what have you found and why have peace settlement efforts failed and especially for Afghanistan led to this new cycle of violence there? Um, thank you, Senator. Uh, good question for me to dive in. Um, my, my research particularly looks at the Taliban, but uh, looking at it, things historically, I'm stoned and, and, and amazed how things are repeating what I have read in, in the books um, um, uh, happening again. To count instability in Afghanistan, um, take, let's say since the Soviet invasion in 1979, it is now about 42 years that Afghanistan has been at different scales of war and um, half a dozens of agreements um, have been signed um, uh, for peace or for political settlement. Uh, they all fell apart. The continuity of the conflict and the failure um, to reach a sustainable political settlement is that um, they were not attempted to address the root causes of war and violence in Afghanistan. And on the other hand, um, it can be understood um, uh, in the motivation, behaviors, and interests uh, of actors um, at all levels. Um, in making peace, um, the actors lacked ripeness, um, the regional and international geopolitical rivalries, and uh, a lack of a guarantor to ensure implementation of those um, so-called peace agreements that were signed all led to renewal of the cycle of uh, violence in Afghanistan. Um, in a comprehensive uh, peace settlement, uh, uh, the future of political power, the terms of governance are negotiated between conflicting actors to bring a dispute uh, to an end and prevent future ones from occurring. And in a peace uh, settlement, um, it is different from, from a settlement what we are seeing today um, after winning a conflict militarily and imposing um, its rules on the country. Uh, this is when justice is neglect neglected. Um, but for an enduring peace settlement, um, the conditions and the actors have to reach that conclusion that they cannot win on their own militarily and continuation of fighting uh, would hurt them um, further. Um, here I'm referring to uh, William Zotman's term, um, right for resolution, that I've been looking and uh, sort of understanding it in the context of Afghanistan. Um, as a, as multi-dimensional um, uh, is expected that a conflict would be, such as a, a, a conflict in Afghanistan, um, it, it, it's very complex um, uh, due to its ge uh, geographical positioning in the region. Uh, with very sensitive neighborhood neighbors, and of course uh, the involvement of superpowers, Soviets, and then the U.S. But of course, on the local level, our own very diverse forms of actors and um, uh, everything else that plays on the local level. To settle the conflict, um, the Afghan conflict, um, um, uh, it, it has two dimensions: it's a local and it's international. Uh, and, and to reach an enduring peace, both layers have to be addressed. Uh, 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 and, and by that, I mean that a consensus had to be re reached uh, among the international and regional actors that the conflict in Afghanistan have to be settled politically. And, and, and there, as there is a consensus about the terms of peace in Afghanistan. And that can then be interpreted on the local level to nourish um, the condition for a settlement to take place um, among the um, Afghan actors. Uh, I'll just give two examples, two very brief examples, historical and contemporary, to say exactly what I mean. After the Soviet um, exit plan from Afghanistan, uh, it began negotiations with the, uh, with the US and with the neighboring Pakistan who had 
um, a huge role in the conflict um, to sign a non-intervention agreement known as the Geneva Accord. Um, it was signed on, um, in, on 14th of April, um, 1987 after 12 rounds of talks, um, and it was facilitated by the United Nations. Both the so Soviet and the US agreed on a, time, on a time frame for the withdrawal of the troops, and then, um, and then for the two powers to act as guarantors in the Afghan war and facilitate the final settlement among the Afghan warring factions. Um, and then at the Afghan uh, level, the strategy was to bring together all different fighting factions, including the Dr. Najibullah's government um, to, to negotiate um, the future of governance in Afghanistan. But the accord quickly uh, disintegrated um, because Mujahideen fighters were not included in that accord and they were not abiding the terms of that accord. And then the US withdrawal happened and then both superpowers did not committed to their role as guarantors of the, of the conflict. On the other hand, um, our neighbor Pakistan did not show any interest in ensuring a political settlement up, um, between the Afghan actors, um, um, uh, believing that the government in Kabul, the communist government would collapse anyway. The conflict uh, dynamic so was not ripe internally within the party and externally and in the region and internationally that abandonment that happened. Having that in mind, fast forward today in the last three years or so, we have, I have been sort of capturing this international consensus around the need for a political settlement of the conflict. Um, but uh, but uh, a serious negotiation did occur with the Taliban as one of the main actor of conflict in Afghanistan. And then we saw the 29th of February, um, 2019 US Taliban agreement uh, which was told uh, to be a peace agreement, but it was revealed to be an exit agreement, um, mainly the way in which it was executed, um, uh, further damaged any prospect for a comprehensive uh, peace settlement between the Taliban and the Afghan government. There was a sense of fatigue uh, by the Taliban to settle the conflict, and on the other hand, of course, by the Afghan government, very high um, uh, 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 statistics of casualties on both sides. Um, I mean, it's still too early um, uh, to make a concrete judgment about um, about how that how, how the failure of uh, while there was a sense that to settle the conflict politically, and then why we saw why we are today. Um, it's too early to talk. Um, but I think it's that lack of international consensus once again uh, on a negotiated uh, settlement for Afghanistan and the U.S. Is, has to withdrawal and its, its exclusion of the Afghan government as the one of the main actors of conflict from the negotiation with the Taliban and then um, Pakistan's failure in, um, in, in, in seizing its support and sanctuary to the Taliban it all led to the situation that we are in today where the Taliban felt empowered and emboldened, um, uh, which they believe that they have defeated the US militarily while they still had um, enough support from the region to be able to continue to fight militarily and did not um, commit to that so-called intra-Afghan negotiation uh, meaningfully to, uh, to negotiate. Um, and and uh, a, a final point, just to uh, looking back, uh, the only good thing in the last few weeks that we have seen is that uh, there was no uh, intense bloodshed um, in the streets of Kabul as the power was seized. Um, uh, but in the last uh, 20 years, um, uh, of the gain of the last 20 years and the future of Afghanistan have been uh, damaged uh, in that silence that the world have observed uh, in the last um, one month or so. Yeah, and we'll come back to your views on the future of Afghanistan and, um, in a little while, but you have highlighted um, you know, the key actors and I guess the, the lack of consensus. And I, Majib, I want to come to you with a couple of these key actors and talk to you a little bit about them. Um, I mean, competing political ideologies have clashed in Afghanistan, as we know, resulted in this protracted violent conflict. So how can we explain the ideological undertones, I guess, of both two of these, I guess, key political actors, if I can group them as such? 
One of them is, of course, the American-led Western occupation and then the Taliban. Could you try and kind of unpack that for us? Yeah, I'm good. Um, you can hear me, right? Yep. So look, I in the, 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 the story or the narrative of, of the Afghan tragedy over the last four and a half decades to me is, um, you know, not to reduce it, but it, it could, a lot of it could be explained by sort of uh, reflecting on the ideological totalities that, that have crashed time and again, and that despite their claims that they draw from sort of different, sometimes competing master texts, in many ways, they are quite Eurocentric in their uh, ideological or theoretical uh, dispositions. And, and you know this includes sort of the socialist, socialist violent revolutionary socialist experimentations, the Islamism of the early 90s, to some extent in a more, you know, Taliban is a more of a complicated, more of a puzzle sort of theoretical question, but certainly Taliban as well in their first go at, at uh, serving as a custodian or um, just being a state. And certainly the post 9-11 liberal uh, regime that was imposed in Afghanistan. All of these to me, contain sort of uh, deeply seated, very problematic, uh, hegemonic uh, imaginaries for what Afghanistan should, should look like. And they are sort of convinced of their ideological promise to the point where in realizing uh, that promise or seeing that promise to materialize, they see killing and maiming and destroying as, as justified. Uh, the Taliban and the American occupation, sort of the militant liberalism that the American occupation and the forces that it unleashed on society sort of embody. And the Taliban, uh, especially when it comes to their more extreme, more sort of um, visible neo um, uh, uh, uh sort of commitments or investments, they, they both very much uh, embody that fundamentalism. We are obviously led to believe, we are expected to believe over the last, you know, the discourse setting power of the West is such that we are led to believe one is um, to, to denigrate or to critique one, in this case, the Taliban means to champion the other, in which case the, 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 the liberal regime and its violences. But I, I think we, we ought to move away from that and just study them for what they are. And in that sense, if you do, I think another force kind of comes into the mix. And it's this force that I credit uh, as um, sort of taken away from some of the sharp edges of either of these ideological forces. Uh, it is the type of resistances that cannot be contained within the political language and praxis of the Taliban, uh, as, as much as the type of sort of voices of dissent that was always there, uh, if one looked closely enough. And oftentimes in sites and spaces and by actors who we don't sort of account for enough. We are too concerned about systems and formal processes. But even within the uh, government or state establishment, these voices were there. I credit these, the sort of impetus to, to, to dissent to another force, and that is tradition or traditionalism of Afghanistan, a different type of knowledge perspective or even political life and experience that is not too concerned about sort of global visions, uh, instead looking to the local for its political and social aspirations and priorities. It's Islam is not necessarily one that is Salafist, Jihadist, or new, even new Diubandi for that matter, but perhaps it's one that takes its cues from the original Diubandi uh, madrasa system and its Sufism and its spiritualist approach to organization of society and its relationship to a state. It's not the static as we were led to believe for a long time, rather it's dynamic and responsive. It dwells in the in-betweens of the old and the new and doesn't necessarily choose one over the other, but instead comes to terms with imaginaries for the future uh, uh, through negotiation and dialogue and uh, sort of uh, 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 an inward as much as outward, an exterior and interior interiority defines it. Uh, and, and I think that force has been, since really, we got, if you got to go back to mid 19th century initial encounters or even earlier encounters, Afghan encounters with uh, British colonialism later on, post, post independence nationalism, uh, some of its figures which continue to be low, loudly championed by the establishment over the last two decades. And then if we kind of make our way forward to more revolutionary or radical politics of the post 60s period, and then where we are right now. A lot of these forces have been there. And just, just one last point, Senator, if I have time. The resistances that I'm talking about, and it's important to define it as 
in the plural or describe it as in the plural. Um, I, I think uh, uh, that is, it, it gives a lot of Afghans, gave a lot of Afghans even over the last, you know, the, the challenging last two decades to assert a sort of agentic capacity for the Afghan that, that could challenge or perhaps reimagine um, the, the liberal regime of, you know, when it was operationalized from the, you know, infamous slides that we all hear about and know of, whether it's the security agenda or the developmentalist sort of uh, state building agenda. The, and, and, and interpreting it from the slides to the, to the, to the actual material setting there, it was always involved a sort of interpretive agency that I feel like a lot of Afghans uh, drew from and, and, and relied upon to maintain a sense of familiarity to what was being done to their home and their, their, their society. The same applies to Taliban. I feel like um, there, it's not a monolith and to describe it as such, I think it could be quite misleading and takes away from a lot of potential for conciliatory politics and, and peace and coexistence down the line. Uh, there are internal debates, internal dynamics and its own uh, approach to organization against the American occupation of the last two decades have been redefined by a deployment of this sort of interpretive agency by Afghans and even groups of Afghans from many different political sites. And in some ways, Majib, you're kind of emphasizing what um, Parkundaya was saying as well. It, it, it is multidimensional, it is not binary. Um, and you know these complexities cannot be ignored. So we'll also come back to that in your reimagining of the future. Uh, but I want to go to Mohib now. Mohib, your work has been in the war economy and of course, uh, the impact on Afghanistan's economy has been massive over the last 20 years of violence, and it has become highly dependent on aid um, and the war expenditure during that time. So given the nature of um, the aid industrial complex, which is often with a Western colonial perspective, how much of a need is there to rethink international development aid and how it is delivered? Thank you. I mean, when we look at the Afghan economy, uh, so it's economic development in the context of active conflict, where violence was very high and, and continually increasing, and a lot of fragility, and that fragility is institutional fragility, social fragilities, and regional fragilities. I mean, Afghanistan was struggling with, with the countries in the region. Um, so if I divide, I mean, I don't want to go too back uh, into the history, but if I divide the last 20 years into two periods, uh, there is a strong positive impact of the inflows of aid and the, the inflows of the money that came through the war um, at the early stage between 2003 and 2013. That's the 10 years where um, there were two main effects uh, in play. There was low hanging fruits in terms of development. For example, uh, higher teachers built education. They hired 200,000 teachers and built education. So that created jobs on the one side and brought development on the other side. Create health, that was a very simple thing. Uh, start you know, building infrastructure. Those low hanging fruits created economic growth, uh, they created, um, they, they, they pushed the poverty down by a huge margin. Uh, and at one point, we had 36% of people living under the rate of poverty, which has been one of the best uh, in, the, in the many, many decades that we can look back to. Uh, and another factor that was at play was big push. And that is where I think the trouble starts to sort of flow in. Uh, the big push, uh, sort of when President Bush was talking about the master, the European master plan level money flowing to Afghanistan, uh, these sort of theories are, are supported by people like Jeffrey Sachs and others, and they are very, uh, if I pick, uh, uh, borrow a word from, uh, from Mujib's uh, talking, these are very sort of Western Eurocentric uh, or so say Washington consensus type driven uh, ideas. And what those did to, to, to the structures in Afghanistan is because institutional structures were not built, government institutions were very weak and capacity did not exist. And when you top that up with a lot of money, what you happen to do is you actually create a crisis of corruption. Which, you know, I don't need to go into the details of it. I mean, I will come back to that a little bit. Uh, and you create uh, problems of legitimacy because then you evaporate trust from these institutions. At the, at the same time, the intention is to build institutions 
that can serve people and create trust and legitimacy. On the other hand, corruption is impacting the same institution, the same intention in hugely negative way, and people move away from these institutions. Then what happens in 2014, when the international troops start to decline from its peak of 160,000, these troops brought logistical support and that had a lot of money, that flowed a lot of money into Afghan economy. Any local services that, that also caused a lot of, uh, sort of brought a lot of money. They were also implementing military-led development projects through provincial construction uh, teams. Australia had one in, or in Orozgan. Um, so what that did is uh, when you tie aid strongly with security, then what happens is that's where uh, you make development as a target for the insurgency that was going on. And that I think uh, brought in a huge another impact where uh, development in many of the areas of Afghanistan started to become impossible. And that's where we centralize power in the centralized institutions of, of constitution and all the other, but then aid automatically became centralized because the periphery was so insecure. And, uh, and when I say periphery, I mean, I mean rural Afghanistan and many, many cities, smaller cities. So that's where the aid centralization happened and Kabul became, uh, I mean, you know, where all these big offices exist, the UN was there and everyone else. Now, what went wrong in this? I mean, I said the positives were very good economic growth, the reduction of poverty, the establishment of education sector, health sector, and many, many other positives. I mean, we made small progresses in the rights sort of spares as well, the women's rights and all the others. Um, but what, what, what started to sort of go wrong in this sense? So Afghanistan suffers from this binary, uh, and this is again sort of to build a little bit on Mujib's uh, sort of argument, is it's either too much aid or there is no aid plus sanctions. That's the 90s of Taliban. And, and I'm gonna come back to this when we talk about the future again. Mm -hmm. Or there is too much aid where the money is put, thrown at everything to solve every problem. While that is not the solution, um, in that sense, the developmentalism that happened in Afghanistan, uh, and I, I, here I want to sort of pick out on the corruption, where usually the understanding is that Afghans were corruption, corrupt, and the Afghan leader and elites were corrupt, and there is no denial of that, absolutely. But let me break it down a little bit. So the aid amounts, how much money should be given to Afghanistan, these decisions were made in DC, in Brussels, and in Australia's case in Canberra, and in Tokyo, I mean, these were the major donors, you know. Uh, where this aid should be allocated, these decisions were usually made by embassy officials or officials within development agencies of these countries. So that is the second sort of tier of, of decision making. In the third tier of decision making, every NGO and every other organization that was run, uh, they have to bring in foreign uh, leaders and elites to sort of. Uh, be able to then communicate with the, the, the first two layers that I mentioned and sort of get money through that. What that did is that created a very strong asymmetry in the decision-making on how aid should be spent. So when we talk about corruption, yes, a lot of corruption in government, a lot of corruption in military contracts, but this corruption was not only uh, sort of conducted or facilitated by Afghans. Of course, there is a lot of Afghan names that are out there for us, and the foreign names are very few, uh, just because no one know this, no, knew those people, no one, I mean, Cigar is, is one of the agencies that had done a lot of work on that. Um, just to sort of close it and, and be sort of cognizant of time, I think uh, uh, the, the, the development and the sort of the war economy that was built in Afghanistan uh, suffered in the initial stage from too much money. And then once the money started to sort of dry down, the economic growth decreased, poverty increased. And I think the economic indicators were the proxy that you could see that the collapse was coming. At least uh, since 2016 or 18, we could see that things were not going in the right direction. Thank you. And I'll come back on the future a little bit uh, from the same sort of uh, uh, perspective. Thank you. We definitely will. Thanks, Mohib. Uh, Salma, if I could go to you and can we all know how tough Afghan women have had it, decades of Western military occupation and now back to the Taliban rule. So if you could take us a little bit into the lives of Afghan women, 
and tell us what effect, what impact um, has, have, has these decades of uh, war ha had on them? Um, well, uh, thank you. Uh, okay. From the very first perspective, um, okay, when we see, say the victory of Taliban, um, it means um, victory of Taliban is the failure of US and its allies in Afghanistan and the end of a bloody war, you know, a, a war that women were the very first victims of that. But uh, from the first side, um, you know, this war needed to end. People really could not stand it anymore. Now that who's the winner and how they lead the people is another side of issue, uh, which I would come later on. At least uh, now uh, or for a while, women are not going to be the victim of war anymore. So the fact that in all war years, women from both sides, I, I consist from the both sides, uh, Taliban and National Army and uh, or as civilians lost their husbands, sons, brothers, and, and that it was women again from the both sides. Who, who in a patriarchal Afghan, uh, Afghan society had to feed the surviving family. Um, likewise, in war zones, uh, those and forms of uh, violence was happening, ranged from the domestic violence to honor killings and, and field trails. Uh, and all of them were kept um, due to the lack of any media in conflict um, areas. I can say the best years of uh, girls um, yeah, left were taken away from them um, by all these political, uh, political uh, and, and military conflict, uh, you know, we had mothers who were um, innocently witnessed uh, years of enmity between uh, her two beloved sons because one of them were, was with Taliban and the other one was with National Army. Um, you know, uh, in addition to all the challenges, the war had subjected women to different kinds of psychological um, tortures. Um, even um, I can say I myself, I have always said this, I'm from, from the generation of war. I was uh, born in war, uh, you know, spent my childhood, education, and, and uh, uh, finally grew up in, in this miserable war. I have always felt as other women, uh, a, a strange relationship between myself and this horrible war. I can say women were really tired and broken of this war. Um, I know the women from inside of our society who were deeply willing to give some of the, their freedom, some of their beautiful dreams to, in exchange for the Taliban and use that government of Kabul just in hope if they form uh, or bring them a coalition or share government without any foreign interruption. Um, so now you think, um, I, I guess it, it, uh, it's an, uh, you know, now, now you, you may think how sacrificed they could be who have been holding their wish, dreams, uh, aspiration in their hands for years and are ready to, to trade them with two power-seeking and extremist uh, groups in ex exchange for peace. All they wanted, I can say, all they wanted was peace, nothing more, uh, which, which unfortunately never happened. Um, Honestly, US and its allies failed in, in case of peace building in Afghanistan. Okay, war is over, but, but uh, there is no, no peace today. Today from here and, and after war, um, while war is over, I, I express my deepest regret for all the people, um, especially women who were, uh, you know, who were be, uh, been uh, sacrificed in any possible way in this war as an Afghan, uh, furthermore, as an Afghan woman who I experienced this war with my all being, I know nothing was, was worth uh, this war. Honestly, today, no reason can justify the all violences that uh, was caused us to face. You know, um, I, 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 I think world leaders shouldn't forget that they owe an apology to the Afghans, especially Afghan women for their involvement in starting and, and advancing this bloody um, war under the pretext of ending the conflict and supporting people, they continue to, to the war for many years and left the, the people to be as victims, you know, um, because Afghans to pay for something that they had no share in that. And that's so painful. Um, at least even now they could uh, end it, um, you know, responsibly. You see, there is no war, um, 
in, in our country. And I'm happy for that. At least women are not going to be uh, victims of war anymore. But uh, it's a question at what cost did, did it end it? Okay, I think this is exactly where the second side of Taliban's victory comes. Um, the, the domination of Taliban at the same time means the collapse of another democracy right, right in front of um, uh, a seemingly democratic world, um, a democracy that Afghan people, especially women, uh, deeply hoped and worked for uh, for, for two decades. Um, it means that from other side, after the end of war, women are at risk of lose, losing their basic freedoms. Once again, I'm, I'm really worried about uh, women who are on the verge of a huge destruction. Their hopes and their achievements are too young uh, to get raised. Um, all, all these achievements of women dear, um, during these two decades are unfortunately very superficial and and I think they can uh, you know uh, they can disappear very easily. Um, unfortunately the the previous US back governments uh, weren't as powerful and independent as to make any possible and fundamental changes in women's life. Um, they have been using women in different ways as symbols to give them legitimacy, you know, legitimacy to foreign occupation who had uh, brought them on power and to, to their puppet government. Um, it's true that women had a, had a, a large, um, large share in political life. They had, you know, a large share in parliament, go uh, government positions and uh, public and uh, private sectors, but uh, this political contribution was so symbolic, unfortunately, that they could not use their positions uh, to build a different space in, in, in social and, and economic sphere of women, or I can say um, th their political contribution was not enough to address the social and economic challenges of women from a um, how can uh, from a, a broad feminist perspective uh, and today a huge part of women has already no hope for their future while most of them were studying and doing um, uh, their job despite the social and economic challenges um, so Taliban even from now on ignoring their basic rights of education and working their um, identities are in danger of being erased. And this is, I think this is a, a huge humanita humanitarian crisis. Uh, from here, I want the world to, to do not leave them again on the hands of uh, Taliban alone. Mm -hmm. um, Salma, thank you so much for telling it like it is. I mean, your perspective is so valuable and I think people ought to listen to it so seriously so that we can we never make the mistakes that have been made um, uh, in the last you know, 20 years or so. So thank you so much for having the courage to say that. Um, Jawed, what role do you see social media um, has played in conflict in the region? And what do you see the role of social media in peace, uh, peace and cohesion efforts in Afghanistan? So when social media came in Afghanistan uh, roughly in 2005 or six, um, the, there were a lot of promises. Um, like many other countries, people thought that this could be a democratizing force where uh, underprivileged groups of society find a force, you know, um, uh, a voice in the, in the policies that, that affect their lives. Um, but it also became very clear from the outset that quite on the opposite, it's also a forum in which extremist voices, either religious yeah. or ethno-nationalistic or other uh, extreme voices uh, are highlighted. Very simply, you know, it's not a moderate place. Social media, if you want to be reshared or if you want to be retweeted, you should say something rather controversial. And these kind of controversial things have affected the fabric of societies all over the world. Even societies like Australia, United States or, or the United Kingdom that have uh, strong institutions. They have even cyber laws in place. But in Afghanistan, these laws didn't exist, didn't exist and there weren't any institutions to enforce these laws. So there was quite a, quite a mix of things that came out of social media in Afghanistan. 
The other interesting thing, the reason that it was promising at the beginning was that Afghanistan is a very tough terrain and there were very few working roads in Afghanistan. So people living in different remote areas rarely had the opportunity to talk to one another. But social media allowed that. People from various ethnic backgrounds, women, men, people from social backgrounds could talk to each other in real time. Um, and in the case of Afghanistan, it was quite unique because Afghanistan is a very oral country. You know, the culture, the history, the way people think, your social relations, they are all very oral. So um, you didn't have written or documented things, you know, a lot a, a, about a lot of things. You know, even some of the concepts that constitute the core of Afghan identity, they were all unwritten. People would talk about it in the past, and but then forget about it. And, and it was sometimes good because some racial, ethnic stereotypes, some social tensions, they would, they would be talked about small groups of people and then certain parts of the country will never be, um, will never be touched by them. But with the social media, what happened, people started talking about it, but also documenting them. For the first time, they started writing about them. For the first time, they recorded videos. The videos became popular. They, they went viral. And with that, it affected a lot of people. You know, it affected not only people who lived in Afghanistan, but also Afghans who lived in overseas as far as Australia. Um, so I am now working on this and I'm working with all the data that I'm collecting. Um, and I haven't done my analysis, so I'm not going to give away much. And I'm not, because as I said earlier, my supervisor is here too. And I don't want to give her the impression that I've already concluded my findings. So, so I'll, I'll just say that as social media has had this role one of the um, one of the uh, uh, one of the things that we know least about is how the Taliban used social media, because ultimately they came and captured Afghanistan, right? So many of people like me who looked at the world through our own social um, media settings, but also as social groups, we are taken aback. We were, extremely surprised by what the Taliban uh, were capable of. So one of the things that actually happened after Kabul was, was captured by the Taliban was I, I went to a state of shock because I realized that all the things that I knew about the world, about Afghanistan, they were probably wrong. Or the way I thought uh, about Afghanistan, it was probably wrong. So there has been a lot of you know internal tensions um, created in, in um, the Afghan society, but also with the Afghans. Um, so I, I, I don't know what, what will be the future of social media in Afghanistan, because um, what the Taliban did, for example, when they were fighting, um, and they are still fighting in Panjshir, one of the first things that they did was to stop the telecommunication services there, so people can no longer use social media. Because for the Taliban, um, uh, you know, social media also serves as a way as a public opinion uh, platform. Mm -hmm. So they are worried about that. And some of the Taliban politicians are quite using the social media to sweet talk their atrocities. Um, and I think in some ways they think they are they're, um, um, successful. But let's see, it's a very complex situation. Mm -hmm. That's coming through, um, you know, loud and clear. And I think we haven't dealt with it as a complex situation. So we uh, await with bated breath for your publication and your analysis. Um, Zerlash, Zer talk to us about how the political conditions impacting Afghanistan have played out in the lives of Afghans in Australia. Sure. So um, I think uh, there's a number of factors that uh, are important to consider when thinking about the position of the Afghan diaspora uh, to Afghanistan. Uh, one is that they operate in a very dynamic transnational social field. And so what I mean by this is that multiple facets of their lives are impacted upon or touched by events, uh, socio-political conditions, information, ideas um, from multiple sites, which are situated here in Australia, in Afghanistan, 
um, within other diasporic sites around the world, as well as online spaces, uh, which Joed's work um, would uh, um, come under that. So, and then when we when we think about it in that way, we can see that it's not purely, uh, you know, people don't receive information just by what's happening um, in Afghanistan, you know, with a back and forth to where they're living here in Australia. There's, you know, there's multiple ways uh, where they're impacted through information and other issues. And, and given that Af Af Afghanistan has um, been experiencing the more than four decades of war and instability, this, this has led to a multi-generational experience of war. So although the impacts uh, might be experienced differently um, between different generations, for example, for those who left um, 40 years ago versus those who are um, you know, born 20 years ago, uh, such as the generation within Afghanistan of Salma or, or those who were in, uh, born and raised in Australia. And they've come of age uh, within the war of terror. There will be a lot of difference and nuance in context of their experiences, but the, the, the thing that binds them all across all the generations is this collective sense of exile of, of an ongoing conflict. Um, and so, and that speaks to the, uh, as well, without, besides generational differences that depending on um, uh, which group you're part of, which ethnic group or which area or region of Afghanistan you've come from, the different political conditions um, have impacted uh, people, different groups at different times. So there's, there's a lot of diversity in the experience of war. And so, uh, what this sort of brings us to is um, to, to come to see the, uh, the extent of how the range of geopolitical forces that all um, my learned uh, colleagues have been speaking to, the way that all, the, you know, the way that policies are made, the way that uh, state interest, interests impact upon the lives of uh, Afghanis people within Afghanistan and the nation itself, how this trickles across um, to societies such as Australia or diasporic communities in Australia. And so we see how um, through uh, social media, um, through media, uh, people learn about um, what goes on there. And, and what I've noticed is that in, you know, where previously people had limited access to media or limited access to telecommunications, today, uh, you know, there are very robust um, media available, there are fast, efficient, cheap access to communication. And so people who are in diaspora communities or those in Australia have really um, had an opportunity to immerse themselves in the issues that are going on there, in the politics that are going on there. I mean, it's a common Afghan experience that people receive the news of what's happening in Afghanistan in their lounge rooms every day watching music shows and the news. And, and so people are feeling a lot closer to Afghanistan in these past 20 years, uh, despite all the other complexities. And so I think what's been interesting to observe um, through recent events, but through uh, my data as well, that you know people were feeling closer to Afghanistan, um, despite the complexity around what has happened, despite many people citing that, you know, they are concerned that there are American forces there, but they could they could also see that there's relative stability. And so, uh, yeah, so basically we, we can see how these range of complex factors do impact upon people here. And at the moment, um, people, you know, the communities uh, have been caught off guard. Um, they're impacted by the fact that they do have uh, families back home. They're impacted by their sense of connection to a nation that, you know, people were beginning to gain hope that Afghanistan is being, you know, able to stand back on its feet. There was a lot of symbolic um, uh, potency in the fact that, you know, having the robust media there and having uh, the national anthem and the flag and, and all these aspects that were speaking to Afghanistan functioning again, and people could have a sense of connection, they could travel back there. So I think a lot of hope has been lost in, in that sense that, uh, you know, we... People had imagined in Afghanistan that uh, we'll be able to stand again, we'll have some longevity, despite these, these complex political conditions and despite these complex geopolitical conditions. Um, I think so, yeah, so what, what, what's happened is that 
they, I think for me, it's it's people impacted not just in real terms, in terms of safety of their families there, but then that, that sort of that sense of nostalgic sense of what does it mean for our future, for the future of our nation and our sense of Afghanness. So just on the question of future, and I'm looking at the time, but I do really want all of you to answer this question shortly, uh, like in a short and sharp manner. One minute maybe for each of you. I know it's a big question, but just looking at Enzalas, we'll start with you. Looking through your unique lens, where is the future piece of Afghanistan going to come from? Um, well, I think the diaspora community have a very powerful and important role to play. Um, after such a long experience of war, the four decades of war, that means more than four decades where uh, people of Afghan heritage have settled um, around the world and they're embedded in communities now. They're, they're better educated, they're better positioned um, to, it's not that they have the potential, they are already demonstrating that they are well placed within civil society, that they're better able to advocate, um, uh, you know, to their elected officials, um, they're able to leverage uh, established media and social media, they're able to provide a more nuanced perspective of the you know, the diversity of voices and experience of what people want. So despite uh, Afghanistan having, uh, you know, a range of different experiences, there, there seems to be a unified voice in that saying people are more concerned about the fate of the Afghan people and ensuring a sense of justice for them uh, to have a chance to be able to build the nation. And I think diaspora communities are in a very uh, strong position to be able to work towards that in terms of raising awareness uh, advocating and, um, you know, leveraging funds and things. It's something that the communities have been doing for decades, but they're in a position now that they're better able to coordinate with, with one another. They're better able to connect with each other transnationally. Uh, so I think there's a lot to say um, and a lot of potential for the diaspora to be able to work towards um, the future of Afghanistan in, you know, aligning with, with the wants and needs of those who are based there in Afghanistan. How about you, Jawed? Your one minute starts now. I'll just repeat what uh, Salma said earlier that the Afghan women uh, were victims of the war. But I think um, there is a high chance that they will be the victims of the peace, um, peace in Afghanistan. And that's quite painful. And that actually takes me to the point that what do we mean by peace, right? It's, is it just the absence of, of fighting or is it more, more um, you know, social harmony? Um, I think if we consider peace as something between these two, um, that, that will only come to have, uh, in Afghanistan if there are at least three set of conditions met. One is that the state of Afghanistan represents the will of all people of Afghanistan. It is not dominated by a single party, a single political or nationalistic or religious or any other form of what, what um, um, Mujib earlier aptly said, fundamentalists. So, so any, any um, state should be uh, democratic uh, as democratic as possible. The second condition is that the state structure uh, is able to mirror the hopes and aspirations of the Afghan most effectively. A highly centralized state in Afghanistan that has not worked in the last 20 years will not work under the Taliban or never will work. The problems of people, especially in the local level, especially in the rural level, should be dealt with people who actually uh, have a stake in, their, in these people. So in other words, the, the governors of the people should come from the local people and they should not be paternalistic in, in saying, you know, we know more than you ignorant people, but actually seek their accountability from those people. And the third condition for me is that uh, people or the majority of people in Afghanistan should be able to find food, dignified livelihood in a peaceful society. In other words, the economy of the, the war economy should not disturb the, the peace economy. So unless these three conditions are met, I don't think there will be ever any peace in my beloved country. Salma, how about you? Prospects of peace in Afghanistan? Where do you see that coming from? 
Uh, well, um, in the case of women, I really want to be optimistic about the future of women. Uh, but by seeing what is happening in Afghanistan to our women during last month, I cannot be really. Uh, all the action of Taliban make me say that, say that uh, the future of women is uncertain and, and also painful in Afghanistan. The biggest challenge facing by Afghan women is the lack of security, uh, tough teridations and patriarchy and the Taliban's mindset. Uh, the Taliban's attitude toward women is rooted in, in uh, I guess, in their traditional uh, beliefs about the status of women um, who do not equate them with the men in terms of human, human dignity. Um, Taliban since their inception in, in, uh, in years before uh, 2001, uh, they have given no role to women and I think they have no plan to give them any right in the future too. Uh, when the Taliban came to power in Afghanistan, they declared as woman has right to work and, and educate, but in less than a month, we saw what happened. New conditions were set for, uh, for the presence of women in society, conditions that, um, that drove them um, out of community and send them back home. And I think this is a repetition of experience uh, of uh, you know, previous year, years, they announced their cabinet uh, members while there was not even the name of one woman in their government's uh, structure. Um, after several weeks, uh, I noticed uh, a few days ago, um, it was, I, I guess, they announced that, that boys could go back to their schools, but um, but not even a word about the girls. Um, women are worried uh, that they will lose at least their right of education, work, and many other uh, things. Um, this concern is more about the independent women in Kabul and some other provinces. Uh, despite all uh, challenges, we had uh, women in Kabul who were running um, you know, restaurants and were somehow engaged in small businesses. But today, it's not clear how they Taliban will uh, will deal with these women and their works and and at the same time the growth and development of, of society is not possible without the participation of women. Uh, one of the obstacles to women's active participation in, in politics is economic and, and social and also cultural factors which unfortunately Afghan women are deprived of, uh, of that and again this is due to the weakness of post 2001 political system in Afghanistan it means the uh, post 2001 system failed to bring about a, a, a positive uh, and fundamental change in economic and social dimensions of women uh, so today, using the same uh, social and economic support, women were able to meet the challenges posed by the Taliban. Uh, so hence all the, these uncertainties about the future, social and economic shortcomings and the challenges just left as the legacy of, of previous use back system make women's future unpredictable. Uh, but the, it is clear that the Taliban that determines the future of, of Afghan women uh, through their actions, and it is the international community that determines the fate of women by controlling and, and uh, I guess, monitoring the Taliban. Uh, Mohib, how about you? Short, sharp um, answer. Very sharp. I mean, to achieve what Jan very nicely sort of categorized for us uh, and marry that with the reality that Taliban as a fundamentalist group has now taken Afghanistan by, by force. I think the only policy leverage that international community has on Taliban are aid and recognition. The denial of aid and recognition will create a situation where the world will have no leverage with Taliban regardless of how the country goes. Also creates all, create a lot of catastrophic humanitarian situation for Afghanistan, including malnutrition for children, hunger, lack of access to health, and very, very basic things. The provision of aid and recognition uh, without properly optimizing these to create conditions for what uh, Javed Jan very nicely outlined, I think there, that is where sort of the solution in a sense lies that it should not be given to Taliban to enable them to implement and to sort of, you know, uh, 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 sort of bring about 
their regressive policies and regressive approaches to the so, so that should not happen. Mm -hmm. uh, aid and recognition should be used to leverage them when the world wants to make a difference in Afghanistan. So that is, I think, where how to find that. I don't think it's an easy thing, but that will need a lot of work. And of course, a lot of, uh, I mean, a very diverse Afghan opinion in that sense, what to happen and how the aid to, should be provided and how, where it should be denied and where it should be provided. Thank you. Thanks, and Mujib, and then Farkunde. Mujib, you're mute. Thank you. Uh, sorry about that. So just, I said, reiterating what Mohib just said and what Salma just said, there is a need for aid in Afghanistan because the 36, 37 million people who are looking at it, this gloomy horizon, which is a potentially very catastrophic, even worse than what it is right now, humanitarian crisis, that requires a splitting between the domain of aid and political differences or these sort of ideological uh, investments that give us a lot of self-confidence and to allow that to infuse uh, those sort of principles or sensibilities into our policy making agendas. Uh, so I think there is a certain need for that. And also it will help us to avoid a repeat of the 90s, which, which, is, which is very much possible. On another point, uh, sort of perhaps more on the cultural side of things, which is as much a part of this problem as or the material imperatives of the war on terror, state building, and of course the Taliban insurgency over the last two decades. I think in the cultural side of things or in the world of symbols, perhaps, there is a need for a sort of double critique, not to uh, necessarily bash one while championing the other, but instead to critique both the fundamentalisms that emanate from a long tradition of extremism and colonialism and an awesome capacity to hegemonize and assim demand assimilation of difference or others. In the West, as much as we do that to the Taliban, I think uh, in, in, in that sense, we could then allow the space for a sort of a different sort of sensibility that could come from what is familiar and, and what is perhaps easily recognizable for a lot of the Afghans, which assumes a foregrounding or centralizing of the Afghan subaltern perspective as opposed to metropolitan or even perhaps so-called alien uh, political imaginaries that have defined Afghanistan's political conflicts over the last couple of decades whether it is, you know, a site put beyond sort of Salafist imaginary or whether it is uh, Washington senses sort of modernization theory, Walt Rostovian modernization theory, or even state building, but, you know, the text of it, which only emerged in response to Afghanistan and Iraq in 2004 and onwards. All of this, um, including what Farhonda earlier, uh, sorry, I think it was Joey John who said earlier, uh, you know, how a lot of the literature and pontification and that exists on Afghanistan, it, they just kind of failed quite miserably, especially the more conventional models. Uh, there is a lot of room for critique that goes, has the potential to go both ways, but also values the Afghan perspective enough to give it the room to self-express rather than uh, sort of only using their perhaps experiences and, and then to, uh, you know, use our own interpretive agency to make it something that perhaps it's not. Um, your responses have actually answered some of the audience questions, but if I could go to you uh, last day for Hyundai and just add to the question of what you think prospects of peace are, uh, do you think this the Taliban government in Afghanistan can actually overcome the issues that have been raised like internal divisions and grappling with the legacies of the past? Um, thank you for the question. I, um, in addition to what my dear colleagues have already mentioned, um, and what I uh, highlighted in my er earlier remark, um, uh, there is a need for a plural peace settlement to engage uh, with Afghans from all sides of the conflict, all layers, uh, with the support of our neighbors and then the international community. This is something that then we could hope for a, for the prospect of peace for Afghanistan. The way in which the Taliban have set out itself and what we knew about it and what we saw um, in the last one month, it is doomed. Um, uh, Afghanistan, looking back at its history, at least in the last hundred years, we have had some 12 different regimes, uh, some seven different constitution, never lasted. 
um, even in our own lifetime, we have been seeing changes of regime, but with the Taliban coming in in, in a diverse and a mosaic society like Afghanistan and bringing its own very hardcore fundamentalist um, ideology and view to govern, they're already falling apart. So I think uh, the strategy for the future policymakers should be about how to engage uh, um, uh, with different actors in Afghanistan, with the different political actors, and 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 by that um, more uh, more centrally engage with the people of Afghanistan, because the traditional actor did lack legitimacy, and here yes uh, go with them, but at the same time in consideration to what the people of Afghanistan want. There has been some, uh, we have touched about what peace means for different actors, but here what Salma just said that peace means simple things for us. It's, it's the bare minimum. It's yes, it's the absence of violence, but it also means something as simple as that as a 12 year old girl, you're able to go to school. Um, uh, your very basic fundamental rights are protected. So, uh, and that's, that, that's, those are the core things that the international community should um, focus and engage uh, in Afghanistan um, in whatever way they can um, uh, for, for, for a peaceful future for our country. I'm going to hand over to James now for some closing remarks, but I do want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for the incredible, amazing, unique insights uh, and, you know, I hope we can talk to you again in a few months. Thank you so much, everyone. Over to you, James. Thank you, Senator, and to all the panel. Um, that was an extraordinary hour and a half, and um, I'm very relieved that we have recorded it, so we'll be able to go back and watch it again, because there is so much to take in, and I think uh, uh, we need to understand how this, this conversation that we've had today can be taken forward. As well as thanking the panellists, I also want to thank the Department of Peace and Conflict Studies at Sydney University, especially Diane Tippett and Wendy Lamborn. Thanks also to Suzanne Schmeidel, Leanne Smith and Mujib Abid, who were all instrumental in bringing this panel together. Thank you all. <laughs>